have been in a series for the last six weeks, and um, I've been so thrilled to be able to, to present these messages, and, and with David Swift's help as well. Um, it's been a joy sharing uh, the different aspects of what love is. And we're not looking at what love is according to our culture or according to the world or our neighbor, even though they're really cool neighbors. We look to the Word of God. We look to His Word because that's where we find direction. That's where we find guidance. That's where we find the definition of what love is all about. We discover that love is patient and love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not rude. And we talked about that last week. How many of you ran into a rude person this past week? Come on. You ran into a rude person. How many of you were a rude person this past week? <laughs> yeah. Boy, I was so tempted. You know how I said, you know, God's going to put somebody. God did, and praise the Lord. Um, I failed a little bit, and I had to repent. And it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to, to be loving and to, to be God's ex hands extended and, and His voice and to show that love to people, especially when they're not nice to you, when they're rude to you, right? So we talked about that last week. If you missed that message, you can catch it online. But today we're going to be talking about probably the most difficult of all tests, and that is um, when someone hurts you. When somebody hurts your feelings, when somebody messes with your family, when somebody does something that catches you off guard, that damages you, that hurts you, perhaps this is the greatest test of what love is. 1 Corinthians on the screen, uh, chapter 13, verse 5, it says, love is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrong. We love to keep records, don't we? Hey, we had a garage sale yesterday, and um, uh, we, we did it right before the rains came, but we are, we're getting ready to move this week. We're moving from Salida to Ripon. We're not moving away. We're just moving to Ripon, and uh, we're getting rid of our junk, right? You got to get rid of your stuff, and man, it's surprising how much junk you really do have um, when, you're, when you're moving, um, but we, uh, we, we put it all out, and I was selling stuff like, you can have it for a dollar. I don't care. Just take it, whatever you want. It's a do Everything's a dollar. Just take it. And um, <laughs> we got rid of a lot of stuff. If any of you are interested in my junk, come and see me. I'll sell it to you for a dollar. We have a little bit left over. Um, you can take it all for a dollar. Bless your heart. <laughs> But um, Michelle brought me this large box because she's cleaning out the garage as well and uh, brings out this big tote, um, big green tote, and it has all my stuff in it, you know, all my uh, memories, all my stuff from my childhood, uh, junior high, high school, college, all the yearbooks, um, all the report cards, everything. And she says, you need to go through this stuff, go through it and throw away some stuff. I mean, you know, it's hard to throw away memories. It's hard to throw away stuff. And, and you go through it, and, and, and you're just picking stuff up, and it's like, wow. And I got my report card. My report card was floating around in there. And I've, I saved all that stuff. And I'm like, someday I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need this. Why am I going to need this, you know? Am I, I want to show my kids. And I'm like, I'm going to be embarrassed to show my kids this. This is not a good report card, you know. And so, I mean, we, talking about records, we save all kinds of records. We save stuff, and I, and I was throwing away stuff. I mean, I saved, I, I saved pictures that I drew when I was eight years old. And, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, why am I saving this? You know, I, nobody cares. Nobody wants it. And, and so I threw a lot of stuff away. But... But we, we do save things. We save records and, and um, taxes. You know, we keep them for seven years, right? Isn't that what you're supposed to do, seven years? And, I mean, that's what everybody tells me I'm supposed to do. Is we got all these records of our taxes. And I actually went on the IRS website, and it's a big farce. You know, you, you don't have to save it. Well, in, in certain cases, you have to save it for seven years. Don't, don't quote me, please. I could get all of this wrong, and, and you could be audited, and it would be horrible. But... Um, <laughs> I mean, the first thing it says is that keep your records for three years. If situations four, five, and six below do not apply to you, uh, keep records for three years from the date that you filed your original return or two years from the date you paid, blah, blah, blah. Uh, for number three, keep your records for seven years if you file a claim or a loss from worthless securities or bad debt deduction. Keep it for six years. And it goes on. It's got all this whole list of how many years you're supposed to keep it depending on certain situations. But we keep it. We keep records. Keeping records is important. 
Keeping records, paperwork is important. And some of us, we, we keep records on our computers or we keep it on the cloud, right? We've got to have it on the cloud. But when it comes to people doing wrong things in our lives, the Bible says don't keep record of that. Oh, but, but pastor, I like to. I like to keep record of, of things that people have done wrong to me because I may need it in the future. <laughs> if there's ever a situation, I gotta call it up. I gotta bring that up because I gotta get in their face and I gotta remind them of the mistakes and the stuff that they did to me in the past. And the Bible says don't do that. That's not love. We're to get rid of those records, those wrongdoings of the things that people have done in the past. One guy said, when my wife and I get into an argument, she gets historical. Another guy said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, I mean historical. She tells me everything I've done wrong. <laughs> Forgiveness is the most difficult part of love. Think about it. God is asking us to be something that's very difficult for us to be because the culture tells us something different. You know why it's so hard for us? It's because people are idiots. No, that's not why. It, it's, it's because people are so imperfect. People, people are, 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 are messed up. They do things wrong. It, and they're, they're going to mess up. They're going to let you down. They're going to hurt you. They're going to say things behind your back. They're going to look at you differently. They're going to do stuff that are gonna, that's going to tear you up, that's going to mess with your family. They're going to do things, and it's just simply not right. A lot of people, you know, you think about forgiveness, and that's what you're supposed to do as a Christian, but... We all have these misconceptions about what, what forgiveness is all about. We've got these ideas of what forgiveness is. And our culture kind of has, has given us this green light to, to, to tell us, you know, go ahead. Go ahead and do what you want to do. Go ahead and get revenge. Somebody hurt your feelings? It's okay. It makes you feel better. Just do it. I mean, we've got TV shows that are all about revenge. I heard a story once of, Three mean-looking guys on a motorcycle. They pull into a truck stop, a cafe, and there sat a, a truck driver, a little guy. He's sitting at the counter quietly eating his lunch, and these three thugs, they walk in, they grab his food, and they laugh in his face. The truck driver didn't say a word. He got up, he paid for his food, and he walked out. One of the bikers, unhappy that they hadn't succeeded in provoking this little guy to, to fight, he bragged to the waitress, he sure wasn't much of a man, was he? The waitress replied, no, I guess not. And then glancing out the window, she added, I guess he's not much of a truck driver either. He just ran over three motorcycles. <laughs> You know the saying, don't you? Don't get mad, just get, just get even. Our culture has drilled that into our thinking. But that's not God's thinking. That's not the way that God wants us to be as his children. He doesn't want us to act that way. He doesn't want us to think that way. God's word says this in the book of Ephesians, we are to be kind. On the screen, kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ and God forgave you. It sounds so beautiful, doesn't it? You read that and it's like, man, I ought to memorize that. That ought to be a good verse to put on a t-shirt. Be a good verse to put on a, a magnet on my refrigerator, make a necklace out of it. But listen, it's this, until it reaches our thinking, Unless it becomes a part of our lifestyle, a part of who we are. Friends, it's just another nice verse. It's hard to live that way. It's hard to live tender-hearted, especially for us guys, isn't it? 
Because a lot of people in our culture, they say, if you're too tender-hearted, you're not really a man. It's hard. We fight against the culture. Depending on how big the hurt is that was done to us, the greater the difficulty. When you've been hurt, when there's pain that has been caused by somebody else, the last thing that we want to do is to forgive. We don't even think about it. When we're hurt, we want revenge. When we're hurt, we want that other person to feel some kind of pain to the magnitude of what we have felt. We want that person to pay for what they did. And some of you, you're, you're struggling even now as I'm talking because something happened to you maybe last week or maybe it happened a few months ago or even years ago and it's still a part of you. Even me talking about it today is bringing up all these feelings, all this, this hurt. It's being resurrected inside of you because you never really dealt with it in the past. The problem lies when that hurt turns to unforgiveness and bitterness. Bitterness is such a horrible, horrible thing, and, and that bitter root or that bitter spirit, whatever you want to call it, it's dangerous. You choose to swallow the bitter pill. You choose to allow bitterness to take root in your heart and to spread. It's dangerous. In fact, the book of Hebrews, God tells us, make sure that no root of bitterness grows up that might cause trouble and pollute many people. You see, not only does bitterness displease, displeases God, makes God sad, but it will corrupt you and it will ruin people around you. Unforgiveness is not something to mess around with. Some people think, I can, nobody can see unforgiveness. It's not a big deal, Pastor Scott. It's in me, yes, I know, but you gotta understand, what they did to me is unforgivable. I can't do that. I, I, there's some things, people cross the line. I can't do that. Listen, unforgiveness and bitterness it's like a poison. Satan wants you to devour that poison. He wants you to swallow that poison. And he knows that when you and I, when we begin to entertain unforgiveness, when we begin to entertain the thoughts of being bitter towards someone or a group of people, he knows that it's a triple play for him. He knows that, that, that when you do that, it makes God sad. It displeases God. And he knows that it's going to affect you. He knows that you're going to lose sleep. He knows that you're going to get sick. Because that's what bitterness does. He knows that it's going to ruin the relationships of people all around you. He knows that it's going to be a triple play for him. The question is, how do you get rid of it? How do you get rid of that unforgiveness? How do you get rid of that bitterness? There was a guy in the Bible who had every right. In fact, he's in the Old Testament. He had every right to be bitter. Every right to have unforgiveness in his heart. What people did to him was so wrong and so evil and so unforgiving as we look at that. His name was Joseph. You know, his brothers, they, they, they were going to kill him. They, they made this whole plan to kill him because they were so jealous of him. But instead of killing him the last minute, they decided to sell him, sell him into slavery at the very last minute. And, and he went to Egypt, and he became the slave of Potiphar, who was the captain of the palace guard. It was there where Joseph was falsely accused of rape by Potiphar's wife. He spent years in prison and completely forgotten by people whom he had helped. And he's sitting there in prison, and, and the whole time, in spite of his, his prison sentence, in spite of him waiting and waiting and waiting, he never grew bitter. He never allowed bitterness to enter his heart. He never had unforgiveness in him. The story of Joseph shows us that forgiveness is possible. Some of you may have experienced some horrible, horrible things, even as a child things that we can't even speak of in this room, some of you. And it's painful, it's hurtful. But through the story of Joseph, we can see that forgiveness is possible, even in the most horrible of situations. Many of us know the story of Joseph. 
how he rose to power. He became the second most powerful man in all of Egypt next to Pharaoh. We also know, some of you know the story how there was a famine in the land and people had to come to Egypt to get food. And part of that caravan, part of those groups of people were Joseph's brothers. They had to come and get grain. And when they stood before Joseph, who was the second most powerful man in the land, something happened. They didn't recognize him. They knelt before him. They didn't know who he was. They may not really know the magnitude in which they had hurt him. But I want to stop and say this, that we know the people who've hurt us. In fact, some of you see them right now in your, in your imagination, in your mind. You know the people who've done you wrong. You know the magnitude, and, and sometimes those people don't even realize the magnitude in which they have hurt you. But you know it. You're so aware of it because it haunts you. Listen, we're going to kind of switch gears. I'm going to talk about something that's so important, and, and we're going we're gonna to close in just a few minutes. But if you want to forgive people, you've got to do something. You've got to take your proper place before God. You've got to take your proper place before God. And that's kind of the direction I want to go for these next couple minutes. Joseph, Joseph's attitude was really the key to his success. The way he responded. He knew this. He knew to forgive others, we must take our proper place, not before people, but before God. What does that mean? When Joseph's brothers approached him, something happened to Joseph. It says that he spontaneously wept before them. Why? Because Joseph's heart was tenderized. It was tender. Have you ever been in that situation where perhaps you see somebody from your past that you haven't seen from a long time, for a long time, and you come in contact with them, and all of a sudden it brings a flood of emotions? It's because your heart is tender. His heart was tender. And then he said these words, in Genesis 50, verse 19, he said, am I in God's place? Am I in God's place? Joseph, being as powerful as he was, he could have done anything that he wanted to do. He could have taken revenge at that very moment. He could have looked at his brothers and said, you all have hurt me so deeply. You have put me through so much pain and so much agony. Do you realize how long I was in prison? Do you realize the pain that you caused me? He could have looked at them and said, you, 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 you're in prison for the rest of your life. Or he could have looked at them and he said, you can be all ex executed. You're going to be killed for what you did. He could have done that, but he didn't. He assumed his position under God. And this question that Joseph asks is such a good question that we need to ask ourselves whenever somebody wrongs us, whenever somebody hurts our feelings, whenever somebody does something against us, we need to ask ourselves the same question, am I in God's place? Listen, you may have every right. You may think you have every right because the culture tells you that. You were so wronged. You have been so hurt. The devastation that they have caused you in your life, you may have every right, but you will be totally wrong if you act in vengeance in God's eyes. We must assume our position under God. And in order to do that, it really takes three things in us. First of all, we must allow God to be the judge of all. You know that. You know that God's the ultimate judge. The Bible tells us that vengeance is mine, I will repay. But we have a hard time with that. We want to say, God, let me help you out. Right? Let me help you out. Every time we act in vengeance, every time we assume authority that is not ours, we are saying, God, you are not enough. You aren't able you're not powerful enough. You're not just enough. Every time we take matters in our own hands like that. 
God is the only competent judge. He's the only judge that can see into the hearts of men and women. He, can, he is the only one that can see the intent. We've seen a lot of hearings on, on TV and in the news. We've seen a lot of judges, a lot of, a lot of people standing before trial. Only God knows really what's in the heart of people. Amen? We've got to trust Him. Second of all, we've got to trust God's plan. We must trust His plan. Even though people hurt you and devastate you and horrible things happen to you, does not mean that God's plan is diminished in your life. The Bible says that God is a sovereign God who in Ephesians chapter 1 says, works all things after the counsel of His will. Nothing, friends, nothing can thwart the plan of God in your life. Nothing can. Not even terrible, horrible things that people do to you. Nothing will get into the way of what God ultimately wants in your life. And Joseph knew this. Oh, how he knew this. And he says this to his brothers. He says this in verse 20. He says, and as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. What a great perspective to have, friends, when we have been wronged. And I don't say that flippantly. Sometimes really, really bad things happen to godly people. Really bad things happen to good people. I mean, you look throughout history, you see missionaries who've been slaughtered for just going overseas to present the good news of Jesus Christ. We hear of pastors who have been falsely accused. We've, we've heard of faithful spouses who have been so extremely hurt by the unfaithfulness of their mate. We hear of innocent children who have been abused by their parents or abused by people whom they trusted. And the list goes on and on and on. And we, we say to ourselves, God, I don't get it. I don't understand why bad things have to happen to such good people and innocent people. Why does that have to happen? Friends, we need to trust that God has a plan in the mess. God has a plan in all the crud of your life. Some of you may be sitting here today and still you struggle and you say, I have been ripped off in my life. It wasn't fair what happened to me in the past. The devastation, the hurt that was caused, it's not fair. And God would say to you, will you trust me? I'm going to use those bad situations to make something good. I don't know how God does it, but he does it. And we've got to trust him. And not only must we believe that God has a plan, but we must believe that God is good all the time, through it all, that he's always good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 8, 28, where it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We read that verse and we're bothered. We're bothered by it. How can a sovereign God who is all-powerful, how can he be good at the same time? I mean, if God were good, then why would he allow all the suffering? Why would he allow all of the pain? Why didn't God intervene in the situation? Why didn't God put a wall there? Why did he allow that to happen? If he is good, if he is all-powerful, why did he allow the hurt in my life? I know that some of us in this room, you have been extremely hurt by the choices that people have made. You can't help but ask, why? Where were you, God? Where were you when all that was happening? And some of you have been hurt by divorce, by separation. And maybe it was your fault. Maybe it wasn't your fault. Or maybe you've been robbed of a life that was taken from you so quickly. 
And today you grieve and, and you ask why. Listen, guys, I don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers. But what I do know is that we live in a fallen world. We live with imperfect people. I'm imperfect. The people sitting around you, they're not perfect. They make mistakes. There's no one that is righteous, not one who is righteous except Jesus. Here's what you need to know as we're talking about love today. When somebody hurts you, be on the guard. And somebody will hurt you. In the future, maybe today, you're going to get your feelings hurt. Remember this. Remember, remember back when Satan, when he tempted Eve in the garden? Do you remember that whole situation? He tempted Eve by getting her to doubt the goodness of God. He implied that God was withholding something good by keeping her from eating of the tree that God told her not to eat from. Satan will tempt you in the same way. He'll say to you, if God really cared for you, if God really loved you, if God really wanted you to have peace, if he really wanted you to, do, to have all of this, why would he have let that happen to you? He's doing the same things that he did way back in the Garden of Eden. When you and I begin to doubt the goodness of God, what you're doing is, is you're setting yourself up for disaster. A woman named Elizabeth Elliot had a husband named Jim Elliot. Anybody ever hear of Jim Elliot before? The great missionary. If you haven't heard, look him up. Incredible story. He was murdered by a group of savage people while he was trying to preach the gospel in a foreign land. Elizabeth grieved. It was a horrible, horrible thing. Wonderful story, but she eventually got remarried, and her second husband died of cancer. And she wrote these words, and I want you to see them on the screen today. It's kind of wordy, but I want you to kind of get, get the gist of it. She says, the experiences of my life are not such that I could infer from them that God is good, gracious, and merciful necessarily. To have had one husband murdered and another one disintegrate body, soul, and spirit through cancer is not what you would call proof of the love of God. In fact, there are many times when it looks like just the opposite. My belief in the love of God is not by interference or in instinct. It is by faith. It's all about faith, isn't it? Faith. When you and I are hurt, when we are suffering because of someone else's actions, what someone else has done to us, we've got to come to the place where we say, that person meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And God's going to turn it. Amen? God's going to turn that situation. As we close today, I want you to see this on the screen. I can't help but think about the way God forgives us, right? Right? I mean, we are such losers, but God says, I forgive you anyways. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. While we were sinners, while we were still hurting the heart of God, while we were still doing terrible things, that's when God's love was on display. Colossians 3.13, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Forgive others. I want to kind of end with that today. I think some of you in this room, you would say, Pastor, I really don't understand forgiveness. Maybe you're here today and you say, I, I don't even understand the forgiveness of God. I can't even forgive myself for the past, the things that I've done. I've hurt God. Forgiveness is such a wonderful thing, and it's so hard to for us, for our human minds to understand the way that God forgives. But forgiveness is not earned when it comes to God. We don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops. We don't have to do this and do that and go to church and do that and, and, and read this verse and that verse. Forgiveness is solely, it solely comes by 
believing and accepting Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. It's by him alone. Not by good works, not by anything that you can, you can come up with, but it's by God, by his grace. That's what grace is. And he offers that to us. And some of you have taken that free gift because it is a gift. It's not something you earn. And, and you receive it. And forgiveness, it comes into your life. And it creates in you a, a clean heart, a fresh start. And many of you have experienced that. And it's such a, a wonderful feeling to, to have that freedom, that freedom of forgiveness. And when you experience real freedom, genuine freedom like that from God in your life, it makes it a lot easier to forgive somebody else who hurts you. Isn't that true? Come on. That's true. So here's, here's what I want to do. Some of you need to accept God's forgiveness in your life. Yeah, you got other issues. Yeah, you got unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart. But the first step is not that. The first step is this. God, I'm a sinner. I've hurt you. I've done things so, so horrible. And I ask for your forgiveness. And Jesus comes in and he washes us. He gives us a new slate. He gives us power to forgive others. The same love and the same forgiveness that God gives to us, we can now give to others. It's a supernatural thing. It really is. Because I don't know how some people do it. Because some people have been devastated and hurt so deeply by other people in their life, and yet they walk in freedom. They walk in forgiveness. Some of you need to be released from all of that today. Would you stand to your feet? Pastor Travis is going to sing. He's going to sing a worship song. And as he sings, if you are here today and you say, Pastor, I'm dealing with stuff. I need to be forgiven today by God. Or maybe you're here today and you need to release other people. You need to forgive other people. You need to let people go through the grace of God. I'm going to have you come to the front here. We've got a prayer team that's finding their way now to the front. If you're on the prayer team, find your way to the front here. As Pastor Travis sings, if you need prayer today, would you come? Let us pray with you.